E. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism? When you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it. Um, I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society and when you would uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between islam and islamism people like me you and me we are drawing that distinction we're trying to maintain that distinction but if you uh, look at the commentator from the muslim community some commentator they would like to blur this line and they would ask you what is islamism where does it exist sorry it does exist mm. we see it and the teacher this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Hello and welcome to GB News Sunday. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend out there. Um, thank you for joining us this lunchtime. Really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm Dawn Neeson and for the next two hours I'll be keeping you company on TV, online and on digital radio. Cracking show coming up today. In the first hour, Rishi Sunak has confirmed RAF jets were used to intercept Iranian drones and missiles fired on Israel as tensions flare in the Middle East over the retaliatory attack. Then Kemi Badnock has attacked the cowardice of the public sector over gender ideology, calling for more bravery and less cancel culture. Freya, turn on like turn of words there. Is she right though? And yeah, Gordon Ramsay. Uh, squatters have taken over one of Gordon Ramsay's pubs, causing a real kitchen nightmare for him. What's the best way out of that for him? But this show is nothing without you and your views. Um, so let me know your thoughts on all the stories we'll be talking about or anything you want to have a chat about, really. It's Sunday afternoon. Who cares? Um, just very simple. GBnews.com forward slash your say and join the conversation. Talk to me directly. Be nice, though. Or you can message me on our socials. We're at GB News. But first, let's have a look at those news headlines with the lovely San Francis. Dawn, thank you very much and good afternoon to you from the newsroom. Uh, the headlines at uh, one o'clock. The Prime Minister has confirmed that in the last hour or so, uh, he said RAF jets were used to intercept and shoot down Iranian drones and missiles that were fired on Israel overnight. Israel is now warning that the confronting that confronting the attack is not yet over, while Iran says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. Iranian state media has also carried a warning for the US, saying American bases would be targeted if Washington backs Israel's military response. Almost all of the drone strikes were shot down last night without any significant damage. However, a small number did reach Israeli territory, critically injuring a seven-year-old girl and causing some damage to an army base. Israel says it's poised for further aggression. While well, speaking a short time ago, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, paid tribute to the British pilots involved in the operation. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned 
in the strongest terms, thanks to an international coordinated effort which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. Rishi Sunak uh, is also set to join G7 leaders meeting uh, on video call later for urgent talks to discuss the international response to Iran's attack. The Iranian foreign ministry has also summoned the ambassadors of Britain, France and Germany to question what it referred to as their irresponsible stance on its actions. In other news, Angela Rayner is facing mounting pressure over her two homes row after a former aide told police that she had not told the truth about her real home. Her former chief advisor has given a statement to Greater Manchester Police contradicting her claims. Matt Finnegan said there was no doubt in his mind that the Labour MP's actual home in 2014 was with her then husband, not a former council house where she was registered to live. Police launched an investigation this week looking into possible breaches of electoral law. The deputy Labour leader, though, has promised to step down if it's determined that she did commit a criminal offence, but said she followed all the rules at all times. And Sir Keir Starmer says he has full confidence in her. To Sydney, where the family of a man who killed six people in a stabbing spree at a shopping centre there has described his actions as truly horrific. Police believe 40-year-old Joel Couchy suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. Five people, four women and a man, died at the scene of that attack yesterday. And another man, another woman rather, the mother of a nine-month-old baby, later died in hospital. We understand the child, who was also attacked, is now recovering well. The family of the suspect have re released a statement in support of the police officer who killed him, saying she was only doing her job. The Premier of the state of New South Wales, Chris Minns, has paid tribute to the members of the public. Many people would be showing real anger at so many people having been killed and real loss of life. And the individual stories of those that have been killed that have been reported in the media are heartbreaking. Um, I kind of want to search for a silver lining, but it has been incredible to see complete strangers jump in, run towards the danger, put their own lives um, in harm's way to save someone that they've never met before. And, um, look, there's not too many positives to take out of a horrifying event, but um, we've got some wonderful people in our city. Turkish officials have launched an investigation and detained 13 people after a deadly cable car collision there. This was the moment. If you're watching on television, you can see a helicopter rescuing one of the last remaining passengers stranded in midair after that incident. One person was killed. Ten others were also injured. When the cable car collided with a broken pole, ripping the pod open and sending people inside plummeting to the rocks below. And finally, before we hand back to Dawn, some royal news. The Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday parade in Westminster this morning. He's there meeting members of the Guards, uh, ending his time overseeing the prestigious regiment. Edward, who was a cousin of Queen Elizabeth II, will now hand that role over to the Duke of Edinburgh. And the 88-year-old says that holding that position has been a true honour. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. Uh, in the meantime, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan that code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Dawn. Thank you very much, Sam. Right, let's get straight into today's story, shall we? We're starting with the hard news of the day. The Prime Minister has condemned Israel, Iran's attack on Israel and confirmed UK jets intercepted a number of Iranian drones. Yeah. As I said, the RAF moved additional planes into the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm that a number of Iranian attack drones were shot down and we pay tribute to the bravery and the professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect uh, civilians. Uh, I chaired a COBRA meeting on Friday to agree a plan of action. 
Israeli defence officials said more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack. It's the first time Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. Um, joining me now is Defence and Foreign Affairs Editor at The Telegraph, Con Cochran. Uh, Con, thank you very much for joining me this Sunday lunchtime. Now, this is a very scary story uh, for everyone to wake up to. Um, how scared should we be? Well, I think the fact that we've intercepted the vast majority of these uh, missiles and drones fired at Israel shows that our defences are strong. And I'm glad to hear Rishi Sunak um, saying that he took this threat seriously, that proper RAF assets were deployed to the region and took part in the coalition operation to intercept these missiles. So, you know, I think, I think on one level, even though this is a major escalation in the conflict between Iran and Israel, we should take comfort from the fact that um, hardly any of these missiles got through and that they were intercepted and I think the one that did get through just caused minor damage in an Israeli airbase. So, but I mean, there's no mistaking, Dawn, that this is a major escalation. Uh, for years, Iran has relied on its proxies to do its dirty work for it. Now we have the Iranians showing their true colors, launching a massive attack on a country that is an ally of the United Kingdom, which is why our RAF jets were involved in defending Israel. So, you know, I think we need to rethink how we handle Iran very seriously uh, in the months to come. Con, this is in retaliation, as far as I understand, to the Israel attack on the um, compound, Iranian compound in Syria on the 1st of April, um, which took out one of the generals, one believed to be responsible for the horrors that happened on October the 7th. Um, so it is in retaliation for that. And Iran did say overnight, didn't they, that this was the end of it as far as they were concerned, unless, unless Israel and our um, and allies like America and the UK took it further? Well, it's Iran that's taking it further, Torn. I mean, let me say, first of all, I mean, Israel never claims responsibility for these attacks, but this so-called Iranian consulate in Damascus was not giving out visas. It was basically a com command and control centre for Iran's revolutionary guard to control its terrorist network. Uh, which is why the people killed in this strike were all Iranian military personnel. They worked for a unit called the Quds Force, which supervises groups like Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, which we, we regard as a terrorist organization, mm. Hamas in Gaza, another terrorist organization. So this is not just a diplomatic mission. And this this, this sort of reveals, to my mind, how Iran conducts business in the Middle East. It's always trying to deny its involvement in, in all, all these malign activities. But, you know, the Israelis, who we all assume attack the consulate, know precisely what they're up to. And furthermore, you know, groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, who are all backed and directed by Iran, are continuing with their efforts. So for Iran to say that that's the end of it, well, if it was the end of it, then they'd get Hezbollah to stop attacking northern Israel, Hamas to withdraw from Gaza, and the Houthis to stop uh, attacking shipping in, in the Red Sea. That, that's how you draw a line under this. And so long as Iran supports these groups, we will be at war with Iran. So, uh, so Con, what happens now? What should Israel and, and the Allies, I mean, our RAF jets have already been involved in this, what should Israel do now? Well, I, I mean, what, what, what they will be looking to do, as in any military conflict, is to degrade Iran's capabilities to carry on attacking Israel and its allies. And Israel's been doing this, as I said, you know, long before the October the 7th attacks. But since October 7, we've, we've seen a complete uh, increase in Israeli attacks against Iranian-backed groups in southern Lebanon, in Syria. Um, and I, I think that they will continue. And I think the big question is whether Israel actually conducts attacks against Iran itself. And the, the Israelis will think they've got every right to do that. Now they've been attacked. But of course, any act, act by Israel 
against Iran proper rather than its proxies would represent a major escalation and one that could bring us all into a, a direct confrontation with Iran. So, you know, there's a lot to think about at the moment, Dawn. Con a very final running out of time. Just one final quick question. I mean, obviously, uh, one of Iran's closest allies is Russia, already fighting a ground war in Europe. What does it mean for the Russian and, indeed, the Chinese situation? Well, what you're getting, Dawn, is almost a new axis of evil, if you can call it that. You've got Iran, Russia, China and North Korea. Mm. All, f all of these are sort of autocratic states or dictatorships. Um, they are all pouring resources to unite and confronting you know, Western democracies around the world. So I just think, you know, this is a wake-up call for us. Rather than trying to engage with the Iranians and try and encourage them to improve their behaviour, which has been our policy for the last 30 years, you know, we've got to take the gloves off, see Iran for what it is. You know, a lot of these drones that were used in the attack last night are the same drones Russia's been using in Ukraine, and we support Ukraine. So, mm. you know, we've got to have a, a really good look at the way the world is evolving and act accordingly. Con, thank you very much. I have to say you haven't Pleasure. assured me that much. Um, that is uh, Defence and Foreign Affairs editor at The Telegraph, Con Coughlin, uh, joining me this morning to discuss, obviously, the breaking news overnight that um, Iran has attacked Israel. Now, let me see what my brilliant panel make of this one. I'm joined by political commentator Kai Wilshaw and broadcaster and journalist Mike Parry. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining me on a Sunday lunchtime. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to come to you first on this, Mike. I mean, it, mm. it is scary news. You wake up this morning and it's like it's a direct attack on Israel yeah. um, by Iran, not by, not by yeah. Hezbollah or Hamas yeah. or anyone else, by Iran. I mean, how yeah. do you feel? What do you make of what Well, happened? the problem is that now we're at a very high and dangerous level of tit for tat, aren't we? Mm. So Iran was so outraged that their embassy had been attacked in Damascus, despite the fact that there was plenty of evidence that it wasn't being used as an embassy, as Con said. Con said it, was, it, it was full of, you know, military plotters, some of whom had been involved in the plotting of uh, October the 7th. So they get outraged about that and they, and, and, and they made an, a statement immediately after that attack, which they might have regretted, by saying, there will be consequences, we are going to retaliate. So then they had to retaliate. Now then, you know, they cooled off, I think, in the next few days because the retaliation, it was 350 drones, mm -hmm. hardly any of them got through. One of them mildly damaged a, an Israeli Air Force um, uh, station but basically it looks to me, I'm no military expert, like a half-hearted response because Iran realised the consequences of going into an all-out war with Israel. It means the West would then be at war with Iran. There are some neocons in America. I was reading this week John Bolton, the former national security adviser in the US, urging that now there is a reason why we can take on Iran, you know, f for good and destroy Hamas first and then go after Iran if Iran have attacked Israel, which is what they've done. So it's this very high level of tit for tat. What will the Israelis now do to respond? Kai, what do you make of it all? I mean, I totally agree. The, the problem that we have at the minute is that we have this tit for tat, mm. right? And the Israeli allies, as we are, are not willing to call out what are seemingly war crimes in Gaza, right? And so, so we have this issue where you know, we're unable to actually call out what other enemies are doing because of the fact that we're, we're not really being honest about what Israel is doing. And so I don't think we're really being, you know, honest actors in this entire conflict. Sorry, what are these war crimes that are going on? Well, well, the stopping of fuel, food, water to Gaza... No, that's not that, a deliberate that act. That is. That's not a deliberate act. That is to... But that... That, that is to prevent terrorists seizing but, those supplies I, I and do, using them I, I, for their own right. They, they, they are that. letting stuff through. I don't through. accept that. We know they are letting stuff through, but they have to be very careful what stuff they let through and where it goes to, because it just fuels the Hamas army. I, I 
totally disagree. I think that the, the blockade that we've seen has been told by, you know, we've, we've been told multiple times that that is a grievous, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't pass international law. It, it does, you know, <laughs> anybody well, well, could tell. Uh, uh, these are things we can see. We can see these things. You know, uh, uh, satellite you know imagery and so on. We, we can see that there's been a blockade yeah. of fuel, water, food, mm. but also that, that Palestinians have been forced into a corner of their country uh, that, that they can't yeah. escape from, yeah. and that they are being well, bombed I, I, away from. I think Israel and, uh, are looking after themselves in any way they can, and they have to after October the 7th. But, you know, you're suggesting that Hamas and Iran are very aware of international law, and they, you know, they understand international law, and they accept the international laws. Everything they do, everything Hamas and Iran do, is against human nature, is, is yeah. against international law, and are, in fact, war crimes. I, I you totally send missiles into somebody else's country, as they did, it's a war crime. Totally agree. But the fact is that a sovereign country should hold itself to a higher standard than terrorist oh, I see, groups. I see. So they can cheat. Terrorist groups or autocratic countries. They can they, cheat, but the West absolutely. has got to be the good guys and, you know, let's play absolutely fair. We should. You know, let's have Queensbury rules whilst they are committing war crimes from dawn till dusk. It's ridiculous. So, Kai, are you saying that what's happened overnight with Iran launching a direct attack on mm. Israel is justified? Absolutely not. It's not justified at all. But the fact is, Iran is a rogue government, mm -hmm. a rogue country, mm -hmm. and it's been funding terrorist groups that are uh, attacking Israel day and night. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, Israel needs to hold itself to a higher standard. We all are allies of Israel, but we can't allow Israel to be committing what seem to be war crimes on the basis that, you know, that the attack on the 7th of October or this attack by Iran is uh, an invasion of its soil. So just quickly, because we're running out of time, what should Israel do? Just ignore this attack? No, absolutely not. But the response needs to be proportionate. At the minute, it is. But what we saw after the 7th of October was not proportionate. It was. Yeah, the, it was not. Well, you, the, you ignore the, the horrors of the October the 7th attack. I mean, some of the most we, brutal treatment of prisoners in the history of warfare, and they weren't even prisoners, it, they, they, they were kidnapped, they were detainees, and, and you seem to say that, well, Israel should behave better than Hamas and better than Iran. Well, absolutely. Of You've course Israel should fire. behave better than Hamas, because Israel is not a terrorist group. But when Hamas, Hamas is. provoke Israel and, and conduct horrendous and hideous crimes against their people, are you saying, oh, we'll turn the other cheek, you know? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. You seem to be saying, Kai, but the... That's not Honestly. what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, unfortunately, we are going to have to leave it there. We have run out of time. This is a debate that you're probably having yourselves around the country at the moment. It's, it's, a, it's a scary thing to wake up to. Um, it's worth talking about, though. I hope you appreciate that. And if you want to more analysis and opinion on this story, please go to our website, gbnews.com. Uh, right, well, I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday, uh, and there's lots more coming up on today's show. Uh, Kemi Badnock has attacked the gender cowardice of the NHS, politics and police, saying the attitude of the public sector is worse than the ravings of the militants. Wow, strong words. Calling for more bravery and less cancel culture. Is she right, though? All of that and much more to come. Uh, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Don't get too far. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. Mark White was saying there, Sue, that he thinks it's getting worse. And you, again, you were nodding along to that. You've, you've seen this over decades. Situation is sprawling along the coast, more people, yes. and the danger is ramping up. Definitely, um, because the, the numbers and the money is... It's run like a military operation. Mm. I mean, I've been told that by the National Crime Agency and I don't need to be told it by them to know it. It is meticulous because there's so much money involved. So they're, they're marshalling 
migrants here, the gangs, they're controlling the gangs, and there will be a Mr. A Kingpin, mm. you know, in some city far away in Erbil or even in Paris or in Brussels, who never goes anywhere near the beaches. It's like a Ponzi scheme, really. Yeah. With that in mind, um, there's such vested interest, such money, such demand, a never-ending string of demand of people yes. who want to come here. People How are on already Earth? on their way, remember. Yeah. If we stop them now, they're already leaving... There's people leaving the Sudan now are going to reach the only place they want to get to, the French beaches, to get to the UK. They'll arrive in two and a half years' time. And so, you see, they're on their way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I th um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure, I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed, just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Oh, I've just been called a very rude name in my ear. Thank you very much, uh, lovely team outside. Uh, welcome back. This is Chibi New Sunday. Um, I'm Dawn Needham and El Montelli online and on your digital radio. Now, uh, Kemi Badnock has attacked the cowardice of the NHS politics and police over gender ideology. She's not left anyone out, actually. Uh, the Equalities Minister says the attitude of the public sector is worse than the ravings of the militants. And she's calling for uh, scrutiny of transgender policies in public institutions. I mean, we've, we've been talking about it at the cash report all week, haven't we, about what her, um, the Tavistock Clinic and other NHS institutions have been doing to children who are doubting which gender they are. But is Kemi right? Do we need more bravery and less cancel culture? Her words, not mine. Uh, let's see what my panel make of this. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Mike. I'm going to come to you first on this one again, mm -hmm. seeing as our um, uh, Kai was the last one to finish talking, and I'm being fair here. See, Mike, is yeah. Kemi right? I mean, is cancel culture just literally cancelling common sense? I mean, it's an extremely strong um, point of view from her, an extremely. St strong statement. She says in the Sunday Times this morning, uh, launched an extraordinary broadside against politicians of every stripe, the police, the media, the NHS and universities. I mean, that's right across Pretty the board, OK? And her act actual quote is, she says, the cowardice of those in positions of influence was worse than the ravings of the militants. What she means by that is that, OK, if you get raving militants, they're part of our society and they're raving militants. But if people in positions of authority who are running the offices of state are also condescending to extremist views when it comes to transgenderism, then we've got a real problem. And it, it, it's a terribly strong statement. I wish she'd gone on to say the only person, really, who's made any sense in this whole argument and who we should all look up to and who should be given a damehood is, of course, the author, stroke authoress, J.K. Rowling, who is the one person who's spoken out with great clarity on the way she thinks about the issue, which has given millions of people people a focus. I mean, uh, yes, she, and, and for speaking out, she received death threats, rape threats, and yep. all sorts of horrific things on social media. Um, I, I 
tight. I mean, it, it, you know, Kemi's words are always very strong. She never beats about the bush, mm. does she? But she's saying with the trans ideology in particular, not only has it harmed kids, often something they can't do anything about now, but it, it, it's silencing people. People that wanted to protect kids were shut up because of an ideology, not even a factual medical thing, an ideology, the cult of transgenderism. I don't accept that. I don't accept that people who don't believe in tran transgenderism or don't believe in trans children have not been given a platform, because they have. They have been allowed to air their views. We've had this discussion for years and years, and I honestly, I mean, the one thing that really gets me about this debate is that this is a tiny proportion of the population. Mm, this is true. Uh, transgender children, for instance, puberty blockers, are administered to only around 100 children at the minute in the UK. Mm. That's out of, what, 60... 60 plus I, million. I, I totally agree but, with but, that. But, a tiny but proportion, but supported by millions of voices that are encouraging yes. it to develop and develop and develop. But, 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 that, but that's totally acceptable in the way that, you know, the fact is, if somebody as a child feels that they are a different gender or believes that they are a different mm. gender, they have the time over those many years, and the fact is, waiting lists mean that that is many years to transition socially and then to transition medically if mm. they feel... But their brains aren't properly wish... developed, aren't uh, they? Uh, uh, no, but, but the fact is, the, the, the regret rates of a transition surgery are much, much lower than any other surgery that you would see. What, what, and what? so the, the fact... The, yeah. what, what really gets me is that we keep talking about this issue and what it does is make transgender children, transgender people feel isolated, alone, mm. Mm. and, you know, hurled out of society. Well, I... Because we keep... Talking well, about I, I it don't accept that in a way that is because look, if there's a transgen transgender child, you've got to obviously accommodate their feelings and their and their view and all that. Mm. But they're getting an awful lot of support from an awful lot of adults, and their brains aren't developed when they're 12, 13, or 14. And I think they're getting too much support from people who I think are irresponsible to push it because it's an untested science. Now, the story mm. that really shocked me last week because when I'm saying people in senior positions are uh, uh, complicit in all this is uh, two parents who went to the prize giving at their school to see their daughter receive a reading prize and when the award was announced it was given to a boy called Tommy who came onto the stage dressed as a boy but it was this couple's daughter and they had no idea that when she got to school she changed her identity and she transgendered and the teachers knew that happened but the parents didn't and that's the sort of thing I think that we've got to examine very carefully to see where the levels of responsibility in adults rests. I agree with that, I totally agree with that. The fact is I think that if a child wants to transition, it needs to be with the consent of parents. Absolutely. It needs to be with uh, the doctor's consent, uh, multiple doctors, perhaps. But the fact is, you know, at the minute, the debate we're having dissuades that. It dissuades anybody having a reasonable conversation about what makes sense. Now, you, you say 12, 13, you yeah. know, what is the age when we accept that somebody knows their own gender? What well, is the age where we accept that somebody knows their own self? The, the I, mean, I mean, is it 18? The scientific it evidence... 16? Scientific evidence which came up last week is that the human brain isn't really properly developed until the early 20s perhaps 22 or 23. Well, maybe we should raise yeah. the, the, the drinking uh, age, the driving age. No, the, the, I mean, no, no. Where the, do you stop? You're, you're, making a very, <laughs> you're making a very, very serious decision when you want to change the very gender which you wish to be recognised in, in life. And that, you know, that's a huge decision and it should be thoroughly investigated and thoroughly discussed before kids are going to school, changing gender, their parents don't even know about it. That's wrong. And unfortunately, gentlemen, we have run out of time on that debate as well. You two are just so brilliant um, putting both sides no. of the argument, which is what Kimmy is saying. We should hear both sides.
both sides of the argument. Yep. One mm. should not cancel out the other. Debate, not hate, as I say. Uh, right, anyway, I'm Dawn Neeson on GB, but we're not raising the drinking age, by the way. Uh, I'm Dawn Neeson, it's GB News Sunday. Plenty more coming up on today's show. But first, let's get those news headlines with Sam Francis. Very good afternoon to you. It's just after half past one and leading the news this afternoon, Rishi Sunak has confirmed that RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones overnight in what he described as a dangerous escalation against Israel. More than 300 drones and missiles were launched during the strike, almost all of which were intercepted. However, Israel says it's now poised and prepared for further aggression. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. And here the Prime Minister is calling for calm ahead of talks later with other world leaders in the G7 about de-escalating the situation. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says that Angela Rayner has done the right thing by taking independent legal advice amid a row over her living arrangements. It's after her former chief advisor gave a statement to police contradicting the deputy Labour leader's claims. Police launched an investigation this week to determine if there were any breaches of electoral law. Ms Rayner says she'll step down if it's found that she did commit a crime, but insists she has followed the rules. The family of a man who killed six people in a stabbing spree in a shopping centre in Sydney has described his actions as truly horrific. Police believe 40-year-old Joel Couchy suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. And the Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday Parade in Westminster this morning. He's meeting members of the Guards there, ending his time overseeing the prestigious regiment. The 88-year-old says that holding the position has been a true honour. That's the latest from the newsroom. More at two o'clock. Until then, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much, Sam. And remember, let me know your thoughts on all the stories we're discussing today. Anything you want to chat about, by the way, uh, visiting gbnews.com forward slash your say and join the conversation. Talk to me, talk to the panel, talk to everyone. Uh, message me on our socials is another alternative at GB News. Loads more coming up on the show, though. Angela Rayner, just been talking about her, is facing mounting pressure over her two homes row after a former aide reportedly told police she hadn't told the truth. All of that and much more to come. I'm Dawn Neeson and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a bit of a drier start for many of us this morning, all thanks to an area of high pressure situated out towards the south and the west of the UK. However, low pressure never too far away from the north. And this will bring us some blustery winds and plenty of showers that we can already see out there through this morning. These will slowly push their way eastwards as we go through the rest of this afternoon. But further south, where we see that higher pressure, it has been quite a bright start, but there is a bit of hazy sunshine as we head through the afternoon some further cloud bubbling up and that could lead to one or two showers across parts of Wales and northern England. Heavier showers further north though and with those blustery winds temperatures around 9 or 10 degrees but further south not quite as warm as Saturday. Through the rest of this evening, those showers continue to push in from the west, always heaviest across northern and western parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. And they slowly spread their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning. Perhaps some drier weather for a time across the far southeast, but it will be turning wet everywhere by the start of Monday. A chilly night again, temperatures in the south around 7 or 8 degrees, but even chillier still across the north in the low single figures. So a very chilly start to the day on Monday. Those heaviest bands of showers push their way towards the south and the east through Monday. Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head into the afternoon, but there will still be plenty of showers around. These could even turn to snow across the Pennines and the high ground of Scotland. With a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling chilly as well, with highs in the south around 13 degrees.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. is going so well this afternoon isn't it uh, welcome back it's gb news sunday i hope you're having a wonderful sunday afternoon over there thank you for your company i'm dawn neeson i'm on your telly online and on digital radio basically no escape um, now angela rayner is facing mounting pressure over her two homes row after a former aide reportedly told police she hadn't told the truth about her real home her former chief advisor has given a statement to a greater manchester police saying there's no doubt in his mind the deputy leader labor the Deputy Labour leader's actual home in 2014 was with her then husband. Raina has always insisted she's done absolutely nothing wrong uh, when questions over her tax affairs were first raised. She said, I've never been a landlady, owned a property portfolio or been a non-dom. As with the majority of ordinary people who sell their own homes, I was not liable for capital gains tax because it was my, own, my home and the only one I owned. After police announced they'd launched an investigation into whether she broke electoral law, Rayner then said, if I committed a criminal offence, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. The British public deserves politicians who know the rules uh, apply to them as well. Ooh, OK. Um, let's see what my panel make of this one, shall we? I'm going to come to you first on this one, Kai, because mm. you have very kindly... We're also discussing Angela's favourite cocktail, and Kai has very kindly come dressed as Angela's favourite cocktail, which is called a venom. The same colour. And it's exactly the same colour. Oh, it's, it's this colour. Angela makes it in a bucket <laughs> of barbecues. Mm, tasting time, isn't it? Uh, OK, well, now I've started, look, I've got Mike Parry on the panel as well, and, you know, this is an alcoholic drink, and this is Mike Parry we're talking about. Anyway. Mm, it's rather nice. Mm. It mm. is actually... Mm. My, it's interesting. One mouth. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you want the recipe, it's Southern Comfort vodka, um, a blue WKD, and topped up with orange juice. Not that much orange juice, by the taste of that. Uh, anyway, it's Kai, we're talking and about... And Carasso. You've got the carasso. Well, no, but she doesn't do it that way. I couldn't get blue WKD. I was in a very posh supermarket. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was the even question I'm asking? Angela Rayner, I mean, mm. should she... I mean, she's, she's now being investigated by a great amount of yeah. uh, Her former assistant said she was telling Porkies, should she now just put this to bed, come out and say, OK, I may have made a mistake, I'm not sure, I'm going to make a payment um, and then it'll all go away? That's exactly the point, isn't it? The fact is, who hasn't made mistake on their tax returns or their self-assessment. I mean, I certainly Is this something you want to tell your auntie, Dawn? I mean, I, I'm not going to say it on, on, <laughs> on live TV, but, but the fact is we've all made mistakes. But the issue here is that this story has been going on for weeks and Since weeks January. and weeks. And now it's come out into the open, it's come into the mainstream, and Angela Rayner insists that she won't release her tax returns, she won't uh, uh, show her legal advice that she keeps talking about. So the fact is, there's an easy solution to this, but she's not taking that path. And so the story keeps on going. And this... And, yeah, go on, Karen. Well, well the, the problem 
additionally to that is that Angela Reyna has many times called for conservative politicians mm. to resign mm. over much fewer issues. Now, I don't think this is a big deal. Yeah. But she's made it into a big deal mm. by her silence. Yes, yeah. I mean... And, and, and the fact is now, the public are wondering... Yeah. What's going on? But yeah. the, the, the two issues here, isn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, Keir Starmer has backed her without seeing any evidence. He says, mm. you know, the people behind him have seen the evidence. He's backing her 100%. And, and, and this is the former director of public prosecutions who said, mm. oh, I didn't need to see it. Only, you know, only, only the country's most senior uh, legal prosecutor didn't need to see the evidence. Mm. She's gone too far now, in my view, and painted herself in to a corner to be able to do what you've just con um, um, discussed, Kai, to come out now and say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I made a mistake. Because she's been saying consistently, no, I had advice, I didn't. If she comes out now and reveals the full facts, the danger is that she may have misled us, mm. either deliberately, allegedly, or non-deliberately, but she may have misled the people asking about what she did. I can't get terribly excited about it on the actual issue. Yeah. I own two homes um, and I've bought and sold over 20 properties during my lifetime. I know all the ins and outs and how you can go wrong on, on, on capital gains tax and all that kind of stuff. But everybody said this a million times. If she'd killed it at birth in the first few mm. days of this story emerging, there wouldn't have been this problem. But it gives Keir Starmer a terrible problem because it's all now about honesty and integrity, something he has consistently said will be the hallmark of my Labour government if I become Prime Minister. I mean, she is being investigated. She's denied any wrongdoing whatsoever. Let's be 100% yep. clear about that. She is being investigated by the Manchester Police, sir. Um, but, you know, is she at least, at the very least, kind of guilty of hypocrisy because when Boris Johnson was just being investigated right. yeah. over the whole party gate and did he, did he need a birthday cake or whatever, um, she called for him to go then. Mm. So yeah. she, I mean, she's hoisted by her own petard here, isn't she? she? She has painted herself into a corner, as Mike says. Yeah. She, uh, she and the Labour Party have made themselves whiter than white. Yeah. And, and painted themselves as the party of virtue. When, in fact, of course, mm. there are going to be issues. Yeah. Mm. There are go going to be mistakes. There are going to be, uh, you know, errors of judgment. Mm. And the fact that they are not going to accept that at this stage, I think, bodes badly mm. for the future government. Because the fact is... Indeed. Th but there, will, there will be mistakes. There will be ministers who... But who it's, make also, errors of it's also now but becoming a... A, a wider problem for Keir Starmer, because mm. if, at some stage, if he says, look, there's only one way to do this, we'll have to get Angela to stand down while yeah. the investigation takes place, there will then be a huge battle inside the Labour Party oh. to replace her, and her replacement, and she's fairly left-wing, you know, she's fairly up there with the left-wingers there, could be even worse news for Keir Starmer mm. than having Angela Rayner as deputy. I mean, she's seen as somebody who balances yeah. the party, somebody who might take over from her, might be more extreme. Yes, I think yes. the thing is with Angela, and I think why a lot of people like her, is mm. because she's genuinely the, you know, the, the working class. Yes. Yeah. Of Labour, yeah. the gobby northern bird, single mum, you know, I mean, sort of like, you know, sort of like, you know, 16 at work, etc., etc. Yeah. You know, she was she was working as a carer. So if she'd have included that when she originally came mm. out and said, well, you know, the tax law is very complicated, I couldn't afford an expensive lawyer, I was just working as a carer at the time, everyone mm. had gone, yeah, fair point, actually well made. Mm. She could have She could have killed this story immediately. Because the fact is, Angela Rayner is one of the most popular politicians that the Labour Party has. Yes. You look at the other candidates, I mean, Angela Rayner was three to one in terms of odds mm. uh, to be the next Labour leader. Now right. she's about 42 to one right. on the bet for exchange. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, she was one of the most popular politicians mm. in the party. Now she's behind about seven or eight of her, uh, her cabinet colleagues. No, yeah. no. Uh, the fact is, that leaves the Labour Party with an issue. Mm. Because who do they have as an attack dog? Who do they have yeah. as the charismatic leader who can go, mm. instead of Keir Starmer... I, I, I because Keir Starmer is, you know, the, the yeah. technocrat. Yeah. But who can go, instead of Keir Starmer, on the, the morning shows I, 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 and, and attack the Tories? Totally Nobody. Agree. This latest development in the story this morning, the guy who's now sort of saying, oh, no, I'm very sure she lived in the other house, sounds mm. like a bit of a disaffected former it, employee, it, it, well, you know I what I mean? Yeah, it you know, that, that, I mean, I'm not that. suggesting... 
suggesting it is. I'm not libeling the guy, no. but mm. he sounds like he's, you know, got an opinion on Angela Rayner. And then the Labour Party's response to that was what they should have said ages ago. They said yeah. she moved between the two homes. Well, excuse me, because you do when you've got two homes, you can move between the two homes. Instead of steadfastly saying, no, she lived in the yeah. first home, they should have just said she moved between the two. People do. I think okay. we have to move on now as well. Yeah. Um, in any case, yeah. Angela, whatever else, I'm not quite sure about this love, to be honest with you. Oh, I think it's great. Um, yeah, well, you would. There's a surprise. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Jordan Neeson. This is GB News Sunday, and there's lots more coming up on today's show. Um, Gordon Ramsay, indeed. Squatters in London have taken over a pub which is leased by Gordon. What's the best way for him to get out of this kitchen nightmare, though? See what he did. All of that and more to come. You're with GB News, Britain's News. Channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 pm. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of a sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke, and there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes. Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of Companies Fixing Things That Weren't Broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's, that's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, it's GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Neeson, on your telly, online and on digital radio. Now, squatters in London have taken over a pub which is leased by Gordon Ramsay, no less. The pub is currently up for sale with a guide price of £30 million. Um, it is understood that Kitchen Nightmares host Ramsay called the police on Wednesday but was unable to have the squatters removed. The Metropolitan Police said in a statement they were made aware of squatters at a disused property but added, this is a civil matter and so police did not attend the property. Um, OK, um, let's see what my panel make of this. We haven't got much time on this one, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but, you know, you can talk very fast because they've drunk half of their Angela Rayner cocktail. Um, <laughs> Kai, Gordon Rowe, why can't we just boot squatters out? If we own a property or lease property, why can't we just boot them out? I know that's tempting, but the fact yeah. is, long-term empty properties have increased by 24% in the last six years. There's 1.2 million people on the social housing lists. People don't have a place to live. And so these empty properties, these empty restaurants, empty uh, posh flats in London, I can't get that ex exercised about that, to be honest. But, I mean, it's... But, Kai, it's... it's not a domestic dwelling. It's not a hotel. It, it's a even, restaurant even and better. bar. So, you know, it's not even suitable for habitation by people who say they want to live there. It hasn't got the facilities of social habitation, like bathrooms and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. they're just trying to make a protest. But what it does highlight is the enormous um, disparity in fairness in property laws in this country. A mate of mine had a house in Cambridge, you know, which he just rented out. And in between two rentals once, he suddenly got a call to say... The house has been taken over by squatters. They've changed the locks. They just moved in. It took him nine months to get them out, and it was an extremely expensive business. Yeah. Mm. And that's uh, just not fair. It's just not fair that if you've worked all your life and invested some money in property because, you know, interest rates at zero and there's nowhere else to invest your money, and then suddenly somebody who's got no claim to that property and doesn't seem to have earned very much in life takes over your property. It's an outrage. And we've got to change the laws and allow people to go in there, and there are specialist companies who will evict squatters from your home when all the legal process processing has been done, but that could take weeks, if yeah. not months. And it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. <clears throat> Look, I, I was being devil's advocate. Of course I... I know you were. People shouldn't be squatting in people's other people's homes or, or restaurants. commercial properties. But the fact is, until we sort the housing problem in this country, none of this is going to go away. This is going to increase and increase until... No, it's, it, 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 I, mean, I mean, honestly, the, the fact is, people my age... Yeah won't be able to buy a home unless they've got a bung from their parents. Yeah, but what's the practicality uh, uh, of this demonstration? It, it, uh, it's it, not a demonstration. It's not going to free I mean, up more housing for people who are no, on the streets, No, of course not. It? It's people looking to find a place to live. I don't think it's a demonstration at it, all. It, it, it's an anti-wealth, anti-property-owning demonstration by people who've got nothing better to do in life than uh, <laughs> break into other people's property. Unfortunately, yeah. I've got something better to do in life. I've got to find out what's happening with the weather. Um, with Ellie, it's getting hot in here, but is it hot out there? Let's find out, shall we? A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon, but low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those dry conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late, hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above 7 or 8 degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland. And with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. 
Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central and northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Thank you very much, Ellie. And there's lots more coming up on today's show. Well, I say there is, hopefully there is, because these two are drinking Angela Raynan's venom cocktails very fast. But uh, Israel says its allies have intercepted the vast majority of more than 300 drones and missiles launched by Iran. Sunak has condemned the attack and confirmed UK jets shot down a number of Iranian attack drones. All of that and much more to come, including possibly more cocktails, because I am Dawn Neeson, it's what I do on a Sunday. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Pour yourself a cocktail, but don't go too far. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument to... for no, me. What, okay, oh, what, 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 what my guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello and welcome back to GB News Sunday. I um, hope you're having a wonderful Sunday lunchtime out there. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dawn Neeson and for the next hour I'll be keeping you company on telly, online and digital radio. No escape, basically. Uh, coming up this hour, the Prime Minister has confirmed RAF jets were used to intercept Iranian drones and missiles fired at Israel as tensions flare in the Middle East. Then Sunak is on the warpath against the ECHR yet again. He's hit out a ruling by the court that imposes a duty on governments to achieve net zero. 
Should he pledge in the Tory manifesto to pull out of the ECHR, though? Interesting one. And a public row has erupted between West Streeting and ex-Labour MP Diane Abbott over the use of the private sector. Join us later to find out why these Labour heavyweights are at each other's throats. But this show isn't about what I think, it's not about what the panel think, it's about you. So let me know what you're talking about this afternoon, what your views are on all the subjects we're talking about or anything else you want to have a chat about, to be honest with you. Uh, just visit gbnews.com forward slash your say and joining our conversation or message me on our socials, we're at GB News. But first, here's the news headlines with Sam Francis. Dawn, thank you very much and good afternoon to you from the newsroom. Just coming up to two minutes past two. And uh, as we just heard there, Rishi Sunak has confirmed that RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones overnight in what he's described as a dangerous escalation against Israel. More than 300 drones and missiles were launched during that strike, almost all of which were intercepted. However, Israel says it's now poised and prepared for further aggression. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. Here, the Prime Minister's calling for calm ahead of talks later with other world leaders about de-escalating the situation. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort, which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel, but in neighboring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. In other news, Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when they deal with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative's been dubbed Ranim's Law after 22-year-old Rani Muday was killed by her former partner just 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of an emergency. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and that they don't have a plan to tackle it. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper has also said that Angela Rayner has done the right thing by taking independent legal advice amid an ongoing row over her living arrangements. It's after her former chief adviser gave a statement to police contradicting the deputy Labour leader's claims. Police this week launched an investigation to determine if there were any breaches of electoral law. Ms Rayner, though, says she will step down if it's found that she has committed a crime, but insists she has followed the rules. To Sydney now, where the family of a man who killed six people in a stabbing spree at a shopping centre there has described his actions as truly horrific. Police believe 40-year-old Joel Couchy suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. The Premier of the State of New South Wales, Chris Minns, has paid tribute to emergency crews and members of the public. Many people would be showing real anger at so many people having been killed and real loss of life. And the individual stories of those that have been killed that have been reported in the media are heartbreaking. Um, I don't want to search for a silver lining, but it has been incredible to see complete strangers jump in, run towards the danger, put their own lives um, in harm's way to save someone that they've never met before. And, um, look, there's not too many positives to take out of a horrifying event, but um, we've got some wonderful people in our city. Turkish officials have launched an investigation and detained 13 people after a deadly cable car collision. If you're watching on television, you can see here the moment that a helicopter rescued one of the last remaining passengers stranded mid-air during that incident. One person was killed and 10 others injured when the cable car collided with a broken pole ripping the pod open and sending some people inside plummeting to the rocks below. Good news, though, in total, 174 passengers were rescued during a massive 23-hour-long operation. 
And finally, before we head back to dawn, uh, the Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday parade in Westminster this morning. He was there meeting members of the Guards, ending his time overseeing the prestigious regiment. And the 88-year-old has said that holding that position has been a true honour. That's the latest from the newsroom. More at half past two. Until then, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, let's get straight into today's story, shall we? Now, the Prime Minister has condemned Iran's attack on Israel and confirmed UK jets intercepted a number of Iranian drones. As I said, the RAF moved additional planes into the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm that a number of Iranian attack drones were shot down and we pay tribute to the bravery and the professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect uh, civilians. Uh, I chaired a COBRA meeting on Friday to agree a plan of action. Israeli defence officials said more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack. It's the first time Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. Uh, joining me now is defence editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Robert, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, now, this is, I'm going to be completely honest here, frankly, a very scary story to wake up to this morning. Should I be frightened? I think so, uh, because it's got a long way to run. Uh, people are on all sides are assessing what actually was done overnight. It was a big display. It was unprecedented. As you said, it's the first time there has been an all-out attack from Iranian soil to Israeli uh, soil. What does it really mean? Because they fired 330 mm. drones, but only about... Nine, maximum a dozen, got through, according to the Israelis, and the causing a serious injury to a 10-year-old Bedouin girl and marginal damage to one airbase. Um, the Iranians are not going to leave it there. The Israelis are not going to leave it there. Uh, but it, and it's where it goes from there. And there'll be meetings throughout the day, the G7, and the UN Security Council has been called for by all, all, all sides. But I think there will be a lot of taking stock. But you're quite right, Dawn. It goes into another spiral, and the risk is still there that this could spread. How much, Robert, is a threat... Um, is Iran a threat to, uh, to us all? I mean, it, it, obviously, we know it's be behind um, Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis in the Red Sea area. But how much of a threat actually are they? Well, Iran currently is engaged on five, possibly six fronts, if you include the spat that it's having with its fellow Islamic power, um, Pakistan. Dawn, the problem is that it's got a pretty flaky regime at home, ageing, the economy is awful. And when you are in such a bad state domestically and you're very aggressive and very militaristic, you go for adventures. And this is what worries, I think, the world in general. And even some, particularly the Arab world. Remember, Iran is Persian, largely, and with an Azeri uh, population as well. But it is not Arab. And the Arab world is very worried by this maverick, unpredictable behaviour. And I think that that is the main mission of this afternoon, is are you going to talk sensibly, Tehran? Because the Americans have been talking a lot and tried very hard to lay out the terms and thought they had an understanding for um, restrained operations in retaliation for the attack uh, on the embassy in Damascus, which killed two of the senior mm. generals. The Americans knew something was coming, but they gave very, very firm warnings. But it is much bigger, this attack, in its range than was expected. Now, are you going to behave? Are you going to play to the rules or are you going to go saying one thing, misbehave and be very unpredictable? And that is the agenda item uh, uh, now. And that's why we're hearing from Rishi Sunak that we're putting um, more RAF planes into Cyprus, which is an extremely valuable base in all this. And we're looking at 
our duties because we're obligated to work in Syria and Iran to suppress the extremist terrorist movement there, and we're obligated to keep the seas open around the Red Sea and the Gulf. Robert, I guess the best case scenario is that all sides calm down and try and work this out with, with diplomacy, if you can have diplomacy with countries like Iran. But what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario, I think, I fear, is that Iran will just have another go, will just go on doing this. And their newfound allies, whom we haven't talked about over much, we shouldn't be thinking about now, principally Russia and uh, China, I think that they would be pretty embarrassed by that. Russia needs Iran because it needs Iran's mm. kit for these drones, quite cheap, quite basic drones, which they're using a lot of in Ukraine, as we have seen. China needs to get all that oil and gas out of the Gulf. And just before these attacks, a few, uh, a matter of hours uh, before, um, Iranian commandos boarded and grabbed a Portuguese flagged ship uh, around the Straits of Hormuz, that's at the neck of the, mm. uh, of, of, of the Persian Gulf, and said, you know, it's under, we're, we're, we're taking them hostage because it's under Israeli ownership. Remotely, it is. Uh, just to point out, in that particular neck of the water, we know how valuable the Red Sea is. The Gulf is infinitely more valuable, roughly up to 40% of oil and gas, that's fossil fuels, that are exported by sea come from that particular area. And China will be very, very worried about that indeed, because it depends on it. Oh, how, that, Robert, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and, and you haven't really cheered me up that much, it has to be said. That's Robert Fox, um, Defence Editor of the Evening Standard there. OK, let's see what my panel make of this. Um, somehow, I'm, I'm still joined by Mike Parry and Kai Wilshire, who haven't fallen off their seats after drinking <laughs> all of the Angela Rayner special cocktail we yeah. made them. Um, I'm going to come to you first on this one, um, Mike. Um, it is worrying. I mean, I don't want yeah. to be a scaremonger. All my years in journalism have taught me not to do that. Mm. But I think most of us learning about the events overnight can't help to feel that little twinge inside yeah. that where is this going? Well, I've known Robert for a number of years, you know, from uh, my Fleet Street days, and his brilliant analysis of what's going on has slightly depressed me because I thought earlier that the Iranians had not put their full heart and yeah. soul into the attack yeah. on Israel so that they could say to those allies that Robert mentioned, we hit back against Israel, but they didn't actually do yeah. it because yeah. it was designed for the drones to be shot down, that kind of stuff. But Robert's analysis is that they're so unstable, that might have just been an introductory response to Israel, and there could be another one to come, which could, A, be more serious, and, B, of course, I did hear some other defence expert this morning saying, are they trying to wear out the Iron Helmet defence machine so that when the moment comes that Israel have got to restock, they, they hit again? So I feel a, a bit more pessimistic now having listened to Robert, but one hopes that the might and the power of the West, led by the United States, will finally get through to the, um, you know, the fanatics in Iran uh, to convince them that we've very, very serious consequences. Ty, don't you think the problem we've got here is we're dealing, obviously, with a very unstable country. It's, 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 mm. it's a long way from a democracy. The people in Iran aren't that happy with their leaders at the moment. Yeah. Similarly, the people in Israel aren't that happy with their leader either. Mm. So, I mean, you know, the, the leaders in Iran have... Uh, the, the walking a tightrope themselves. They have to prove that they're strong to the people. But on the other hand, they could lose a lot of face here, and that is like a corner trap when they're the most dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have three parties here that we need to think about. We've got Iran and its government, you've got Israel and its government, and you've got Hamas, the terrorist organisation. Now, you talked about diplomacy earlier. Diplomacy has been seen not to work at all in recent weeks and months mm. during this conflict, in a way that previously diplomacy, you know, mm. got us, inched mm. us towards a resolution. The fact is, Benjamin Netanyahu's government is trying to uh, prolong this war, I think, uh, uh, so that they can prolong uh, the time until an election, because they'd lose, because they are unpopular, as you say. Mm. Iran's government 
as you rightly say, have been facing protests for mm. over a year now. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then you've got Hamas, of course, who are facing this you know, tightrope of, you know, uh, how do we uh, remain acceptable to some of the uh, Arab world uh, uh, while also applying pressure to Israel? So you've got all these massive pressures. I don't think they're going away. I think over the next few weeks and months, what you're going to see is a continued escalation mm. uh, because nobody's willing to, to well, back well, down. Well, well, I agree. Because, the, because they have so much skin in the game they, at they this do. point. The problem with Iran is it is such a basket case. And what I mean by that is that there are competing elements at the top of Iran. Mm. I mean, when I say a basket case, did you read that this week, blind date was a mm. show in Iran which has now been taken off the air. How did a programme like Blind Date mm. ever get onto television in Iran? Do you see the yeah. dysfunctional society they live in? It was because mm. of the pressure from young people demanding better TV. But then when the mullahs saw it, they said, we're not having that disgraceful programme. So there are massive internal problems in Iran. Young people want more freedom. The yeah. poor woman, was it last year, who wasn't covering enough of her hair, was arrested mm. and yeah. subsequently died. I mean, it, it's a country, you simply cannot predict what's going to happen next. And I think mm. that, that's from. And when you say about the people at the top of the Israeli cabinet who want to prolong the war, I think they want to end the war by smashing Hamas as fast as they can. Because remember, decisions in Israel are made by a war cabinet, not just by Netanyahu. And, and, and the philosophy is we've got to get rid of Hamas. So, Kai, do you think if Israel... And I know you don't agree with what's going... I mean, who does agree with the mm. slaughter of thousands of people? Nobody does. But do you think if Israel sorted out the Hamas situation, then Iran would step back? Or do you think this is... The genie's out of the bottle now? Well, but how can you sort out exactly. the Hamas situation? How I mean, the, prob the Hamas, problem is yeah. we're talking about apples and oranges, right? We're talking about sovereign states, Israel, Iran, mm. and terrorist organisations who are nimbler, who can act faster. And the fact is, you're never going to outrun them. Mm. Now, the question is, how do you try to neutralise the threat from those mm. terrorist organisations while maintaining your, you know, uh, your rights as a sovereign state and mm. the way that you act? Now, I think Israel is stepping beyond those boundaries at the minute. But the fact is, Iran has been doing that for many years. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, the the thing is, Hamas is not even the most dangerous terrorist threat to Israel. It is mm. Bola in, in, in Lebanon on their northern border. Absolutely. So can you imagine living in a country like Israel where every morning you wake up and yeah. you want to know who's been attacking you last night? Because yeah. those yeah. rockets come in from north and south yeah. and, and you've got to be on alert 24 hours a day. And that's why it's such an emotive issue, because the yeah. fact is Israel is surrounded by enemies mm. and Completely it's looking surrounded. for its allies. The, and we the only democracy in the Middle East surrounded by enemies, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have to. <laughs> I'm surrounded by friends here, they're not enemies, by the way. Um, <laughs> now, we have to move on, unfortunately, we have run out of time. But if you want to know more about this story and continue the debate, please go to our website, gbnews.com. Um, I'm Dawn Neeson and this is GB News Sunday and there's lots more coming up on today's show. Uh, Rishi Sunak is on the warpath against the ECHR again. He's hit out a ruling by the court that imposes a duty on governments to achieve net zero. Uh, should he include a pledge in the Tory manifesto to pull us out of the ECHR, though? What do you reckon? All of that and much more to come. This is GV News, Britain's News Channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I see what you've been saying at home. You're very <sighs> vexed about these China cyber attacks. Colin says, what the hell is our Secret Service doing? They've only just realised what China's up to. You just couldn't make it up. We could have told we you. Knew, <laughs> we knew. We're not surprised. So quite uh... what, Colin, we agree with you. Quite why it's taken GCHQ or MI6 or whatever it is, MI5. It would be MI5 yeah. to know what's going on. And Rod has said, thank you, Rod, if you know how you vote, if they know how you vote, coupled with mass data held also on you, you do, do you not believe they can influence your decision-making process in any way, I'm not but sure. they won't know. I'm not sure they know how you they vote because that. that's that's that... not on record, anyway, no, is it? It is not. Um, and Ken says these are only able to be carried out because of computers, internet, mobile phones, etc. 
it seems to me that these inventions are ruining our lives and therefore we were much safer and much happier without these inventions. There is a school of thought that would agree with that, Ken, very oh, much I so. I sort of often think it myself, really. Me I mean, too. I I mean, the, the, the dark web... I mean, yeah. how many people have been murdered because of the dark web? You do wonder as Brianna, well. Brianna Jai. Yeah, you do wonder. I look at my kids' generation and I wonder whether they will grow up and have a complete rejection of all of this and they will just say, enough, because they will think we were all insane for having become so addicted to our phones. Mm. I wonder whether, as a generation after generation do, they will reject it. Wayne, blame Western governments for the rise of China. People were saying this ten years ago and every country ignored it. That is a really good point, mm. Wayne, because we've taken Chinese investment and obviously our houses are full of items we well, bought from made and, in and China. And if you remember as well, we had to get them out of the 5G, Huawei. We, had we to did. Get them out, get, literally extricate them Yeah, from that us. was at least one thing I think they did quite well. Yeah. And Jan says, if they've seen the electoral roll, what else have they been looking at? That's the threat to our democracy. They never do things by heart. I'm much more worried about my own government looking at what I do online, to be fair. What you said, go back, we said before, the electoral roll is a do public document which you can access if you go to your library. Mm. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. I'm Gloria DiPiero, this is GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Neeson, on your telly, online and on digital radio. Hope you're having a lovely Sunday afternoon out there. Now, lots of you have been sending in your thoughts and I'm going to read some of them out now. Some of them I can't read out. Some of you are very cheeky this afternoon, by the way. Um, lots on Angela Rayner. Um, Stephen, good afternoon, Stephen, says, did Angela really need a solicitor to answer an HMRC question about what address she lived at? Lots of you asking similar questions there. Meanwhile, Alan says, um, Angela called out Tory MPs to resign for lying and Boris had to resign for partying, eating cake and sandwiches. Must she resign? Good riddance if she does. Ooh, not much of a fan of Angela there, are you? Meanwhile, Patricia says, everyone makes mistakes, but come on, I don't care about her private living arrangements, but just don't lie about it. And I think that's what getting people here, isn't it? It's, it's the, the potential lies yeah. and, you know, the misleading, maybe. Well, uh, well, I think the thing is, but she thought it was so insignificant, and it yeah. is insignificant, really. It's, she yeah. just decided to brush it aside and thought it wouldn't come back. Yeah. But politicians should be aware it always comes back, shouldn't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. Espe especially in an election year. The, the yeah. white power is still here. You might have spotted that yeah. one, and <laughs> I will share it as well. Um, but let me think, you know, your thoughts on all the stories we're discussing today by visiting gbnews.com forward slash your say and join the conversation or message me on our socials, really easy, at GB News. Now, OK, let's move on to a Rishi Sunak and that ECHR, shall we? He's having another go, isn't he? The Prime Minister has hit out at the complete overreach of a ruling by the court that imposes a duty on governments, all governments, to achieve net zero. Sunak's latest rage at the court has fueled speculation that he's considering including a pledge in the Tory manifesto to pull out of the ECHR. 
Um, let's see what my panel make of this. Now, Kai, we, we, we set up the ECHR, didn't we? I mean, so we, we, to, we, we, we were there. Yeah. Um, yeah. This decision relates to the, the, the group of Swedish, Swiss, Swiss women, wasn't it? Yeah. Who, who went to... They took the, the government to court saying, you're not clamping down on climate change fast enough. You are putting our health at risk. And the court has ruled on this. And Rishi Sunak is saying, it's out of the jurisdiction. Yeah. But that ruling affects all of us. Yeah. So basically it's saying you have to get to net zero or you're legally in trouble. What do you make of this? I mean, I mean, look, I think the headline screams, right? This looks ridiculous. But the fact is, the ECHR is the bedrock of so much of the legal foundation of what we have in this country. Now, the UK drafted the, the, the yeah. legislation that, that uh, instituted the ECHR. It's one of the UK and Europe's greatest post-World War II achievements. Now, <laughs> you know, this idea by Rishi Sunak that he can pull out of the ECHR as a bit of a gambit, that, I think, is for the birds. It shows his terrible political judgment yet again. I think he keeps trying to find these ideas that will save him from electoral annihilation. The budget, stop the boats, and now pulling out of the ECHR. Now, I think the political question is, why is he trying to grasp at straws mm. that keep not working? And the legal question is, you know, you can pull out of the ECHR. I don't think that's going to change a damn thing, frankly. Is it a vote winner, Mike? Well, look, the ECHR was set up originally to protect people from totalitarian regimes, i.e. we cannot let the world develop a new holocaust and we must protect people in Russia from the communism and the atrocities that that brought. That's what it was set up for. It's completely not fit for purpose these days. I mean, did you know that this, this judgment by the so-called judges panel, the ECHR, was in association with Friends of the Earth? Aided by Friends of the Earth, some 2,000 older women claimed that the Swiss state was exposing them to an increased risk of death from extreme heat. What a ridiculous and ludicrous proposition to put before a bunch of judges. The other thing is, I will tell you, Kai, which I'm sure you probably know, the European Court of Human Rights does not even consist of legally qualified judges. They are people appointed to it by the apparatchiks in the European Union. It's in the same building as the headquarters of the European Union, and if you're a mate of somebody who's high up in the European Union, you can get onto the ECHR. It's completely dysfunctional. It's a load of rubbish. I hope Rishi Sunak carries out his threat to say, if you keep stopping our boat, uh, our, our planes taking off with people to Rwanda, we will pull out of the ECHR because we are no longer fit for purpose. I think that answers my question about whether it would okay. be your vote. I mean, obviously, the Rwanda <laughs> bill is back again mm. this week, isn't it? Before the Commons again. Um, Ping-pong going on between the Commons and the Lords. Um, so that's why we're talking about this issue mm. again. Mm. But, I mean, would it win votes? I mean, do people care about that? Or are we more concerned about the NHS or the cost of living crisis? Absolutely. I think people, when you uh, knock on doors, people are not concerned about the ins and outs of legislation in Parliament. They're concerned about what's happening in their uh, local area. They're concerned about what's happening on their street, potholes, that kind of stuff. I mean, really, the ECHR is not the reason why Rwanda is failing. Well, Anybody is... else who tells you otherwise is lying. Well, hang on, we, 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 we tried lying. to export the fact, people to and Rwanda. Also, one, one and to, time, go, to go further, yeah. the fact is only 1.45% of all the violations of the ECHR have been committed by the UK. That's, that's all that we've been uh, accused of. Now, out of 22,000-plus uh, violations... That's really not very many. We're talking about such a tiny issue here. And the fact is, the Rwanda bill has been scuppered for many other reasons 
than the ECHR, and we should come to terms with that. Yeah, I, I agree, including internal opposition in this country. But we've now got an opportunity, you may well as know as I do, that the bill's coming back before Parliament this mm -hmm. week, and I'm reading, I'm not a political expert, that the House of Lords have now dropped their opposition to it, mm. so there's a good chance now it might move to the next stage. And the last thing we want is an anonymous judge in Europe, remember the last one was anonymous, mm. signing off uh, an order in the middle of the night that that plane can't take off from England. It's outrageous that they have that control over us. And the, the Conservative Party do seem divided on the issue themselves. Why? Yeah, they do. There are, are some that are saying, mm. yes, it would yeah. be a good thing. Others are saying, yeah. a, a bit like you, Kai, no, it actually wouldn't make that much difference. Mm. So, I mean, is this really something that it, we should put to one side, concentrate... But then you give up, Dawn. Then you give up on a policy which has been his flagship policy. I, I, I accept a lot of what people say. It's turned into a gimmick because it's never going to get off the ground. But if it does get off the ground, then he's justified in doing it. I mean, remember, the original thought was to see a load of aeroplanes at Stansted Airport, one after the other, taking off and going to Rwanda. Mm. But it has been so fiercely opposed internally, and you're right, a lot of people on the back benches on the Tory side in the House of Commons don't want it in the same way that they oppose Brexit. Because actually, the Tory party is not any more made up of people who follow true blue Tory policies. Well, well, we know that even Rishi Sunak himself, when he was Chancellor, didn't agree with the Rwanda thing. He thought it was a bit... Well, it was never going to work. Yeah, he, he inherited this policy. Mm. And he's felt that he needs to follow it through. Well, for now, it's, political credibility, it's, it's, you're right. It's yeah. BS, isn't it, really? I mean, the fact that he thinks that he needs to send these planes over to Rwanda and what he wants is that image, as you say, Dawn, of these planes flying off to Rwanda before the election. It's a gimmick, yeah. and we should see it but as the United that. Nations. We shouldn't give it any more thought or airtime, I think. The United Nations send people to Rwanda. From Libya, refugees from Libya end up in Rwanda. Other countries in Europe, Holland and uh, Switzerland, funnily enough, are investigating going to Rwanda. It is a policy that is viable. You've just got to make it work. Yeah, unfortunately, what other countries do, we're not allowed to do because we're probably racist for some reason. In any case, <laughs> um, I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday. Plenty more coming up on today's show. But first, here's the news with Sam. Dawn, thank you very much and good afternoon to you. 2.32 and the latest uh, on the incident in the Middle East. The Israeli war cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran for its overnight assault, warning Tehran will face painful sanctions, including, they say, in the form of missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. It comes as Rishi Sunak has confirmed that RAF planes did shoot down a number of the Iranian drones and missiles launched overnight in what he described as a dangerous escalation in tensions with Israel. The Prime Minister is now calling for calm ahead of a meeting with G7 world leaders to discuss the Middle East crisis. The knife attacker, who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney, advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before he committed the attack yesterday. Police believe the 40-year-old had suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have now released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. Labour here in the UK says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as she says inevitable. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. And the Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guard after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday parade in Westminster this morning and the 88-year-old said that holding the position had been a true honour. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now, though, it's back to Dawn.
Thank you very much, Sam. Now, there's plenty more coming up on today's show, but before I tell you what I've got coming up for you, let's go to the lovely Nana Aquia, whose show is on at 3 o'clock. She joins us, Nana. What have you got coming up on your show? Well, I mean, it is the big news, of course, the uh, massive onslaught from uh, Iran to Israel. But we'll be speaking to Uri Geller, who lives in Tel Aviv, and he's taken some incredible videos of what happened there. He's got videos of missiles that are firing overhead, going towards the nuclear plant and so on and so forth. So we'll be speaking to him, getting an on-the-ground perspective of, of, of that. Also, I'll be asking, were the UK right to get involved and send jets? Should we have done that? And with the news that many of our police recruits are being recruited online without a face-to-face -face, uh, appointment, do you think that our police should be armed, especially with what's happened in Australia? So we'll be looking at that. I've got an incredible mystery guest. Plus, I shouldn't really give this away, but uh, lovely Morag will be on talking about why she was arrested. She's 74 oh. and she was arrested through the Scottish hate crimes because of her mean neighbour. So oh. she'll be live at the end of my show. Brilliant. That sounds like a cracking show. Really don't want to miss it. Thank you very much, Nana. Now, remember, you can let me know all your thoughts on all the stories we're talking about today or anything you want to gossip about, basically, Sunday afternoon. Uh, visit gbnews.com forward slash your say and join the conversation. Or message me on our socials. We're at GB News and there's lots more coming up on today's show. Now, a public row has erupted between West Streeting and ex-Labour MP Diane Abbott over the use of the private sector. Stay tuned to find out why these two Labour heavyweights are at each other's throats. All of that, much more to come. I'm Dawn Neeson and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a bit of a drier start for many of us this morning, all thanks to an area of high pressure situated out towards the south and the west of the UK. However, low pressure never too far away from the north. And this will bring us some blustery winds and plenty of showers that we can already see out there through this morning. These will slowly push their way eastwards as we go through the rest of this afternoon. But further south, where we see that higher pressure, it has been quite a bright start, but there is a bit of hazy sunshine as we head through the afternoon some further cloud bubbling up and that could lead to one or two showers across parts of Wales and northern England. Heavier showers further north though and with those blustery winds temperatures around 9 or 10 degrees but further south not quite as warm as Saturday. Through the rest of this evening, those showers continue to push in from the west, always heaviest across northern and western parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. And they slowly spread their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning. Perhaps some drier weather for a time across the far southeast, but it will be turning wet everywhere by the start of Monday. A chilly night again, temperatures in the south around 7 or 8 degrees, but even chillier still across the north in the low single figures. So a very chilly start to the day on Monday. Those heaviest bands of showers push their way towards the south and the east through Monday. Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head into the afternoon, but there will still be plenty of showers around. These could even turn to snow across the Pennines and the high ground of Scotland. With a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling chilly as well, with highs in the south around 13 degrees. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Oh, 
Well, welcome back. It's GB News Sunday. I'm Dawn Neeson on your telly, online and on digital radio. We've been chatting during the break about the Angela Rayner Venom cocktail, which is now doing strange things. You notice I haven't drunk mine. The two gentlemen to either side of me have. Mm, very this nice as well, as well. Thank you. In their stomachs. Mm. Okay. Mm. It's been described as looking like the Thames and the bottom of a fish tank. Worrying. But it's worrying. Got, it's, Very it's, worrying. It's got thing. Southern Comfort in it. It's got, <laughs> Southern Comfort. It's had Southern Comfort. Yeah, it's, it, it's a medicine. That's a medicine. R right, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and the vodka. OK. Anyway, uh, lots of you have been sending in your thoughts, not just about cocktails. Even though it's a Sunday afternoon, I wouldn't blame you. Um, so let's go. Uh, Angela Rayner. God, you're not liking Angela, are you? Uh, June says, um, Angela Rayner, uh, no excuse in my opinion. Do what the rest of us have to do. If you're unsure, ring HMRC. Guess what, Angela? It's free of charge. Otherwise, pay the tax advice and then follow it. Actually, trying to phone HMRC isn't the easiest thing in the world, to be fair. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Brendan... Oh, this is the Gordon Ramsay one, uh, his squatter problem. Uh, Brendan says, um, I wonder how long it will take Ramsay to get the squatters evicted. With most landlord, it's months of legal loopholes and negotiations and very expensive. We'll watch this with interest. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's one rule for them and one rule for us like that here. Um, and another one on Gordon Ramsay. Um, this is Dave. Good afternoon, Dave. He says, it's not an ideological occupying process at Ramsay's restaurant. It's all about extortion. The occupiers will be negotiating a fee with Ramsay to leave the premises. They'll argue that it's cheaper and mm. quicker than taking legal action. And you've probably got a point. Yep. But one mm. personal one, Kai, for you. This is Jane. Hi, Jane. Um, you've got him blushing already. Um, <laughs> Uh, she says, uh, hi, Dawn, could you please inform that gentleman... That's you. Um, that's it is not Rishi that is saying the H ECHR has uh, overreached. It is half the countryside. We are with him on this one. Be told, young man. He's been fortified by Angela Rayner's cocktail, though, so he's not feeling anything anymore, by the way. <laughs> right, uh, now we move on. Um, a public row has erupted between West Streeting and ex-Labour MP Diane Abbott over the use of the private sector. Uh, Abbott challenged Mr Streeting publicly over the assertion private healthcare could help cut NHS waiting lists, saying there is no principled case for using the private sector. Just as the spare capacity in private health, Wes talks about, does not exist. Only NHS doctors, nurses and the million-pound contracts Wes will give them. But Wes responded by pointing out that Miss Abbott sent her son to a £10,000 a year private score. Hypocrisy? Not much. Um, uh, a bit of hypocrisy going on in the Labour Party here, Mike. I mean, there's a thing. Well, look, um, the private sector is something which a lot of people in the Labour Party reject ideologically mm. because they believe that everybody in this country should have access to the services in this country and they believe that privatisation takes people up the ladder very rapidly because they can pay for it. I am in favour of the private sector for two reasons. Firstly, it's usually more efficient, not in the case of water, I will grant you that, under yeah, circumstances, but certainly, you know, in health and in schooling, it's more efficient. The reason... Um, they mentioned schooling there, Dan Abbott. The reason they want to get rid of private schools is it embarrasses the state sector. Private schools are very efficient. Now, I went to a direct grand grammar school. That means I got a scholarship for the seven years from the age of 11 to 18. My parents could not have afforded to have sent me to that school. It's a brilliant school. It's now a private school and it, and it issues up to 40 bursaries a year to take children from homes who could not afford to pay for that level of education. But ideologically and maliciously, Labour Party want to take it out as a sop to their left wing. You know, private education, disgusting. It's advantageous and, and, and it does the country down. It doesn't. It's a fantastic opportunity. If they, if they kill off private education, where are all the children who now go to private schools going to be educated in the state sector because we haven't got the places? Hi, I think the, 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 the point of the story is it's not just a hypocrisy. I mean, she did send her child to a, a private school and now saying you can't use private health care. Mm. Um, but it's also the fact that the Labour Party... These are two big beasts of the Labour Party are tearing one another apart, very publicly, mm. like the Tories are also doing. I mean, it, it's not looking good for the general election for any of us, is it? No, no. But Diane Abbott is a former Labour MP. I she should, is, I should she, know. She, she lost but she was a Labour MP when she was she having was. a children's She was, of course. <laughs> and it, it, it is quite a spectacle to see these two tearing into each other, especially on a topic that is so emotive for mm. so many people. Because... On the one, there's a bit of a dichotomy here, right? 
On the one hand, people want the best for their children, for instance, and so, yes, many people send their children to private schools, as they should, and that actually takes pressure off the state so, system. Of course. Uh, and same with the healthcare system. People who take private healthcare take away, uh, uh, relieve pressure on yep. the NHS. Yep. The problem is that you then have chronic underinvestment in public services such as healthcare, Why? such as education. Why? I don't understand that. And, 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 and what we have seen from the examples that you gave, mm. Mike, of water, energy, 66% of the public support energy being under public ownership. 69% mm. uh, of the public believe that water should be under public ownership. Yeah, I'm so not disputing we, we that, see by that, the way. We see that, actually, Private ownership has not worked in the last few decades. Well, it, it hasn't so why, worked in water. So why would it work in health and education? No, but in two in, of the most important sectors. No, but in those, in the country. those two sectors you're talking about, it's been proven it does work. Why do you say it would underfund the public sector if the private sector was used more in the health service? What, what, why would it underfund the public sector? Well, that's what we've seen in the last no, decade no, no, and a half a, under the Conservative a, government. No. But we'll see a change. We'll yeah. see a change when Keir Starmer People, don't, people is don't, elected don't understand. Since, the since 2010, the budget for the NHS has gone up 50%. 50% mm. under 14 years of mostly Conservative government. You know, there was obviously the coalition At the all detriment that. Right? of many and, other and, governments. And Wes Streeting, who's a guy I've got a lot of time for, mm. many him, you know, several times, talk to him about it. He's the first real politician on either side to come back and say, look, we can't just keep throwing money at the NHS because the more money you throw at it, the more money it absor absorbs. Mm. We've got to have a look at another way. So I, I support uh, West uh, Streeting on this one. I'm like, so you used to us so good, I just keep running out of time. And as far as public mm. ownership's concerned, I'm just going to say two words. Post office. In any case, uh, this is um, Dawn Neese and this is GB News and there's lots more coming up on today's show. Uh, Tory MPs are concerned the government has made sweeping concessions in trade talks on Gibraltar in order to appease Spain and reach a trade deal. Has David Cameron sold Gibraltar's sovereignty? All of that and much more to come. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat, because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat, because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. You should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually, sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled <laughs> to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded them in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active, every hour. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. 
I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's GB News Sunday. I'm Dawn Neeson on your telly, online, on digital. It's the tiny last weeny bit of the show, but it's going to be a cracker. Uh, Tory MPs are concerned that the government has made sweeping concessions in trade talks in Gibral on Gibraltar in order to appease the Spanish and reach a trade deal, you know, post-Brexit, all that malarkey. Uh, Foreign Secretary D David Cameron has been in Brussels this week for talks with his counterparts from Spain and the EU. It was announced after the talks that a political agreement had been secured, but they're not telling us about it yet. They will tell us at one point, I'm guessing, but at the moment we don't know what's been agreed. But... Mike, there are mm, those that mm. are worried that, um, you know, what's his, what's his official name? Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton yeah. has sold us out a bit to the Spanish in the EU. What do you reckon? Uh, Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton is, in my mind, was the most useless Prime Minister for the last two centuries. And really wish and, and, more, you know and is an even more useless Foreign Secretary now. <laughs> he's just come back from a trip to the United States where he's been roundly humiliated. The Speaker of the House in uh, the US, who is the third most powerful politician, uh, when asked if you would like to meet Lord Cameron, it was a kind of Lord who, and the answer was no, right? Goes off to Mar a Lago to see Donald Trump and, you know, just really brought on the ire of politicians right across America. But his biggest mistake, of course, was smashing up the country, Libya, which he did. I was in Libya several times prior to and after the Americans struck it militarily, and it was a very well-run country. It, 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 everybody knew who was in charge. It was Colonel Gaddafi. And the one thing he did was protect his sea borders, right, because you were going to make sure he wasn't invaded, but it meant people couldn't get out either. Now, it's a basket-case country, millions of people have been displaced, hundreds of thousands have been killed, and it's all down to David Cameron's inability to be anything but, in my view, a political clown. He's not here to defend himself, quite clearly. We have asked him on the programme, but he's obviously busy this afternoon. Uh, we I think Kai will defend him, probably. Um, <laughs> Kai, I mean, this is... A, let's, let's stay on Gibraltar rather than wandering mm, around the Middle East. Mm. We've been to the Middle East. It's not good this afternoon. Um, so, I mean, but, you know, we don't know the details of this deal, but no. it is sort of like, you know, the, the, the sovereignty of Gibraltar and the border control. We've been arguing about it since, since Mike was a boy mm, a long yeah. time. Um, so, what do you think we're going to get out of this? Do you suspect that maybe we have been sold out a little bit to ease the post-Brexit deals through? It, it's difficult to tell. Mm. Look, look, this deal is going to cover things like airports, goods, mobility, and a trade and border deal with Gibraltar would clearly benefit mm. all of us. Everybody, right? yeah. It, it, there are 15,000 Spanish workers who have kept jobs under the current ad hoc uh, agreement that we have. Mm. And so, yes, we need to find a way through this. But I think the bigger picture is this. We are facing a few decades of quite a bit of geopolitical instability. Mm. We need our allies with us, whether that's Spain, whether that's Argentina, for instance, over the... Mm. Uh, 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 you know, over, the, over what is called the Malvinas Islands. Uh, the Falklands, uh, the Falklands, actually. Well, it's... I call... Yeah, no, we well, call them the Falklands. But, 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 but. Carry on with Gibraltar. Yeah. We've been around the <laughs> yes. world already this afternoon. Gibraltar. The Straits of Gibraltar but, but, are one of the most, you know, important shipping lanes in the world, not, yeah. just, uh, not just to us. I think we need to keep our allies close over the next few decades. And if that means getting closer to Spain, getting to an agreement on Gibraltar, like the one that we're yet to find out the details, but it know. seems promising, then they? absolutely we should But I just it. hope we haven't made any concessions. Have you been to Gibraltar? Uh, I haven't. No, well, I have, and it mm. is very British, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you see well, more Union Jacks in Gibraltar than you see in, in London, because they're... Mm. Very, and we cannot not sell not those people out. Uh, no, we cannot sell, of them we cannot sell those, those well, people out. You know, we've got to, we've got to give them assurances that you will always be British, no matter what mm. the Spanish say, OK? 
Well, that's that one. And I just got to tell you, back in the 1970s, GIB used to mean something completely different. There was a thing, it used to mean good in bed. Now, when I... Well, only you would know that, I, one, yeah, you know? I wasn't. I was very young. And you know nothing about it. But I then, don't. as you said, why would you? It means good in bed. <laughs> very harsh, Dawn. One of those, don't need to be. Very harsh. In any case, um, I'm Dawn Neeson. This has been GB News Sunday. But don't go too far, because there's plenty more coming up uh, with Nana Aquia. And that's just in a minute. And she's got some great debate. And then at 6 o'clock, it's Neil Oliver. And Free Speech Nation, even better, at 7 o'clock. And Mark Dolan, indeed, at 9. Um, but thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure to have your company. Thank you to these two young men. But don't go anywhere. Nana's up next. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon. But low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK 